Chapter Thirty One of Nobody's Man by E. Phillips Oppenheim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Berard. Chapter Thirty One. This is how a weekly paper of indifferent reputation but immense circulation brought Talent's love affair to a crisis. In a column purporting to set out the editor's curiosity upon certain subjects, the following paragraphs appeared whether a distinguished member of the democratic party is not considered just now the luckiest man in the world of politics and love whether the young lady really enjoys playing the prodigal daughter at home and in the country and what her noble relatives have to say about it whether there are not some sinister rumours going about concerning the politician in question jane's mother who had arrived in london only the day before was in charles street before her prodigal daughter had finished breakfast she brandished a copy of the paper in her hand jane read the three paragraphs and let the paper slip from her fingers as though she had been handling an unclean thing she rang the bell and pointed to where it lay upon the floor take that into the servants hall and let it be destroyed parkins she ordered the duchess held her peace until the man had left the room and then she turned resolutely to jane my dear she said that's posing besides it's indiscreet parkins will read it of course and it's what that sort of person reads nowadays that counts we can't afford it the aristocracy has had its fling to-day we are on our good behaviour i should have thought jane declared that in these democratic days the best thing we could do would be to prove ourselves human like other people and people call you clever her mother scoffed why my dear child any slight respect which we still receive from the lower orders is based upon their conviction that somehow or other we are after all made differently from them sometimes they hate us for it and sometimes they love us for it the great thing nowadays however is to cultivate and try and strengthen that belief of theirs how did you come to see this rag jane inquired mildly your aunt summerham brought it round this morning while i was in bed her mother replied it was a great shock to me also to your father he was anxious to come with me but is threatened with an attack of gout and what do you want to say to me about it just why did you bring me that rag and show me those paragraphs my dear i must know how much truth there is in them have you been going about with this man talent to a certain extent yes jane admitted after a moment's hesitation chaperoned pooh you know i finished with all that sort of rubbish years ago mother i am informed that mr talent is a married man jane blenched a little for the first time all the world knows that she answered he married an american one of william hunter's daughters who has now i understand left him lady jane shrugged her shoulders i do not discuss mr talent's matrimonial affairs with him surely her mother remarked acidly in view of your growing intimacy they are of some interest to you both jane was silent for a moment just what have you come to say mother she asked looking up at her clear-eyed and composed better let's get it over the duchess cleared her throat jane she said we have become reconciled your father and i against our wills to your strange political views and the isolation in which you choose to live but when your eccentricities lead you to a course of action which makes you the target for scandal your family protests i have come to beg that this intimacy of yours with mr talent should cease mother jane replied for years after i left the schoolroom i subjected myself to your guidance in these matters i went through three london seasons and made myself as agreeable as possible to whatever you brought along and called a man at the end of that time i revolted i am still in revolt mr talent interests me 
more than any man i know and i shall not give up my friendship with him your aunt tells me that colonel falsbrook wants to marry you he has mentioned the fact continually jane assented colonel falsbrook is a very pleasant person who does not appeal to me in the slightest as a husband the falsbrooks are one of our oldest families the duchess said severely arnold falsbrook is very wealthy and the connection would be most desirable you are twenty-nine years old jane and you ought to marry you ought to have children and bring them up to defend the order in which you were born mother dear jane declared smiling this conversation had better cease thanks to dear aunt jane i have an independent fortune woolhanger and my little house here i have adopted an independent manner of life and i have not the least idea of changing it you have three other daughters and they have all married to your complete satisfaction i don't think that i shall ever be a very black sheep but you must look upon me as outside the fold i hope you will stay to lunch colonel fosbrook is bringing his sister and the princess is coming the duchess rose to her feet the family dignity justified itself in her cold withdrawal thank you jane she said i am engaged i am glad to know however that you still have one or two respectable friends the setting was the same only the atmosphere seemed somehow changed when jane received her second visitor that day she was waiting for him in the small sitting-room into which no other visitor save members of the family were ever invited there was a comfortable fire burning the roses which had come from him a few hours before were everywhere displayed and jane herself in a soft brown velvet gown rose to her feet comely and graceful to welcome him so we are immortalized she exclaimed smiling that wretched rag he replied i was hoping you wouldn't see it mother was here with a copy before eleven o'clock tallente made a grimace have you sworn to abjure me and all my works so much so she told him that i have been here waiting for you for at least half an hour and have put on the gown you said you liked best someone said in a book i was reading last week that affection was proved only by trifles i have certainly never before in my life altered my scheme of clothes to please any man he raised her fingers to his lips you are exercising he said the most wonderful gift of your sex you are providing an oasis more than that a paradise for a disheartened toiler it seems that i have enemies whose very existence i never guessed at well does that matter very much she asked cheerfully it was one of your late party wasn't it who said that the making of enemies was the only reward of political success a chief enough saying tallente sighed yet with the germs of truth in it i don't mind the allusion to a sinister rumour the air will be thick with them before long the other well it's beneath criticism but it hurts she laughed wholeheartedly andrew she said for the first time in my life i am ashamed of you here i am hidebound in conventions and i could just summon indignation enough to send the paper down to the kitchen to be burnt since then i have not even thought of it i was far more angry that any one should anticipate the troubles which you have to face come and sit down she led him to the couch and held his fingers in hers as she leaned back in a corner i honestly believe she went on gently that the world is not sufficiently grateful to those who toil for her criticism has become a habit of life nobody believes or wants to believe in the altruist any longer i believe that if to-day a rich man stripped himself of all his possessions and obeyed the doctrines of the bible by giving them to the poor the daily something or other would worry around until they found some interested motive and the daily something or other else would succeed in proving the man a hypocrite he smiled and in the lightning of his face she appreciated for the first time a certain strained look about his eyes and the drawn look about the mouth you are worrying about all this 
she exclaimed yes in a way i am worrying he confessed simply not about the storm itself i am ready to face that and i think i shall be a stronger and saner man when the battle has started in the meantime i think that what has happened to me is this i have arrived just at that time of life when a man takes stock of himself and his doings criticizes his own past and wonders whether the things he has proposed doing in the future are worth while you of all men in the world need never ask yourself that she declared warmly think of your lifelong devotion to your work think of the idlers by whom you are surrounded i work he admitted but i sometimes ask myself whether i work with the same motives as i did when i was young i started life as an altruist i am not sure now whether i am not working in self-defence from habit because i am afraid of falling behind you mean that you have lost your ideals i wonder he speculated whether any man can carry them through to my age and not be afflicted with doubts as to whether after all he has been on the right path whether he may not have been worshipping false gods tell me exactly how you started life she begged like any other third or fourth son of a bankrupt baronet he replied i went to eton and oxford with the knowledge that i had to carve out my own career and my ambitions when i left the university were entirely personal i chose diplomacy i did moderately well i believe i remember my first really confidential mission he went on with a faint smile brought me to paris where we met then came parliament afterwards the war and a revolution in all my ideas i suddenly saw the strength and power of england and realized whence it came i realized that it was our democracy which was the backbone of the country i realized the injustice of those centuries of class government i plunged into my old socialistic studies which i had taken up at oxford more out of caprice than anything and i began to have a vision of what i have always since looked upon as the truth i began to realize that there was some superdivine truth in the equality of all humans notwithstanding the chief arguments against it that by steady and broad-minded government for a generation or so human beings would be born into the world under more level conditions and with the fading away of class would be born or rather generated the real and wonderful spirit of freedom my parliamentary career progressed by leaps and bounds but when in fifteen the war began to go against us i turned soldier you don't need to tell me anything about that part of your career she interrupted with a little smile almost of proprietary pride i never forgot it when i came back he continued i was almost a fanatic i worked not from the ranks of the labor party itself because i flatter myself that i was clear-sighted enough to see that the labor party as it existed after the war split up by factions devoted to the selfish interests of the great trades unions and with the taint of miller retarding all progress had nothing in it of the real spirit of freedom it was every man for his own betterment and the world in which he lived might go hang i stayed with the coalitionists although i was often a thorn in their side but because i was also useful to them i bent them often towards the light then they began to fear me or rather my principles it was out of my principles although i was not nominally one of them that dartrey admits freely to-day he built up the democratic party he had been working on the same lines for years a little too much from the idealistic point of view he needed the formula i gave it to him horlock came into office again and i worked with him for a time gradually however my position became more and more difficult in the end he offered me a post in the cabinet induced me to resign my own seat which i admit was a doubtful one and sent me to fight hellsfield which it was never intended that i should win then miller dug his own grave he opposed me there and i lost the seat horlock was politely regretful scarcely saw what could be done for me at the moment was disposed to join 
in a paltry little domestic plot to send me to the lords this was at the time i came down to martineau the time except for those brief moments in paris when i first met you pruning roses in a shockingly bad suit of clothes she murmured and taken for my own gardener well then came dartrey's visit he laid his programme before me offered me a seat and i agreed to lead the democrats in the house there i think i have been useful i knew the game which dartrey didn't whilst he has achieved almost the impossible has except so far as regards miller's influence amongst the trades unions brought the great army of the people into line i accomplished the smaller task of giving them their due weight in the house very well then jane declared looking at him with glowing eyes there is your stock-taking taken from your own the most modest point of view with your own lips you confess to what you have achieved to where you stand what doubts should any sane man have how can you say that the lamp of your life has burned dull insight he answered promptly don't think that i fear the big fight i don't with dartrey on my side we shall wipe miller into oblivion it isn't true today to say that he represents the trades unions for the very reason that the trades unions as solid bodies don't exist any longer the men have learnt to think for themselves many of them are earnest members of the democratic party they have learnt to look outside the interests of the little trade in which they earn their weekly wage no it isn't miller that i am afraid of then what is it she demanded how can i put it he went on thoughtfully well first of all then i feel that the democrats when they come into power are going to develop as swiftly as may be all the fevers the sore places the jealousies and the pettiness of every other political party which has ever tried to rule the state i see the symptoms already and that is what i think makes my heart grow faint i have given the best years of my life to toiling for others who believes it who is grateful who would not say that because i lead a great party in the house of commons i have all that i have worked for that my reward is at hand and it isn't if i am prime minister in three months time there will still be something left of the feeling of weariness i carry with me to-day it was a new phase of the man who unconsciously had grown so dominant in her life she felt the pull at her heart-strings her eyes were soft with unshed tears as her arm stole through his please go on she whispered there is the ego he confessed his voice shaking why it has come to me just at this period of life but there it is i have neglected human society human intercourse sport pleasures the joys of a man who was born to be a man i am philosopher enough not to ask myself whether it has been worth while but i do ask myself what are the next ten years who am i to give you counsel she asked trembling the only person who can then i advise you to go on this is just a mood there are muddy places through which one must pass even in the paths that lead to the mountain tops muddy and ugly and depressing places as one climbs one loses the memory of them but i climb always alone he answered with a sudden fierceness i walk alone in life i have been strong enough to do it and i am strong enough no longer jane he went on his voice a little unsteady his hands almost clutching hers it is only since i have known you that i have realized from what source upon this earth a man may draw his inspiration his courage the strength to face the moving of mountains day by day my heart has been as dry as a seed plot you have brought new things to me the soft humanizing stimulus of a new hope a new joy if i am to fight on to the end i must have you and your love she was trembling and half afraid but her hands yielded their pressure to his her lips and her eyes the little quivering of her body all spoke of yielding i have done foolish things in my life he went on drawing her nearer to him when i was young 
i felt that i had the strength of a superman and that all i needed in life was food for the brain i placed woman in her wrong place i sold myself and my chance of happiness that i might gain more power a wider influence it was a sin against life it was a greater crime against myself now that the thunder is muttering and the time is coming for the last test i see the truth as i have never seen it before nature has taken me by the hand shows it me tell me it isn't too late jane tell me you care help me i have never pleaded for help before i plead to you her eyes were wet and beautiful with the shine of tears it seemed to him in that moment of intense emotion that he could read there everything he desired in life her lips met his almost eagerly met his and gave of their own free will andrew she murmured you see you are the only man except those of my family whom i have ever kissed and i kiss you now again and again because i love you End of chapter thirty one Chapter thirty two of Nobody's Man by E. Phillips Oppenheim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Chapter thirty two Talent, notwithstanding the glow of happiness which had taken him down to Westminster with the bearing of a young man, felt occasional little shivers of doubt as he leaned back in his seat during the intervals of a brief but portentous debate and let his mind wander back to that short hour when he seemed to have emptied out all the hidden yearnings which had been lurking in the dark corners of his heart and soul his love for jane had no longer the boyish characteristics of a vague worship he made no further pretenses to himself it was jane herself and not the spirit of her sex dwelling in her body which he desired a tardy heritage of passion at times rejuvenated him and at others stretched him upon the rack he walked home later with dartrey clinging to the man with a new sympathy and drinking in with queer content some measure of his happiness dartrey himself seemed a little ashamed of its exuberance if it weren't that nora is so entirely a disciple of our cause talent he said i think i should feel a little like the man in the pilgrim's progress who stopped to pick flowers by the way she is such a help though it was she who pointed out the flaw in that second amendment of saunderson's which i had very nearly passed did you read her article in the national too wonderful talent murmured there is no living woman who writes such vivid and convincing prose and the amazing part of it all is dartrey went on that she seeks no reward except just to see the cause prosper she hasn't the faintest ambition to fill any post in life which could be filled by a man she would write anonymously if it were possible she has insight which amounts to inspiration yet whenever i am with her she makes me feel that her greatest gift is her femininity it must be the most wonderful thing in life to have the help of anyone like nora talent said dreamily my friend the other rejoined i wish i could make you believe this there is room in the life of the busiest man in the world for an understanding woman i'll go further no man can do his best work without her i believe you are right talent assented his friend pressed his arm kindly you've ploughed a lonely furrow for a good many years talent he said nora talks of you so often and so wistfully she is such an understanding creature no don't go just one whiskey and soda it used to be chocolate but nora insists upon making a man of me talent was a little in the shadow of the hall and he witnessed the greeting between nora and her husband saw her come out of the study a soft entrancing figure in the little circle of firelight gleaming through the open door she threw her arms around dartrey's neck and kissed him dear she exclaimed how early you are come and have an easy chair by the fire and tell me how everyone's been behaving dartrey with his arm around her waist turned to talent an entirely unrehearsed exhibition i can assure you talent 
he declared nora pouted and passed her other arm through tallente's that's just like stephen she complained advertising his domestic bliss never mind there is room for an easy chair for you tallente took a whisky and soda but declined to sit down i walked home with stephen he said and then i felt i couldn't go away without seeing you just for a moment nora dear man she answered i should have been terribly hurt if you had do make yourself comfortable by the fire you will be able to check all that stephen tells me about the debate tonight he is so inexact tallente shook his head i am restless tonight nora he said simply i shall walk up to the club she let him out herself holding his hand almost tenderly oh you poor dear thing she said i do wish i knew what what to wish you what to hope for you he walked away in silence they both understood so well he found his way to the club and ate sandwiches with one or two other men also just released from the house but the more he tried to compose himself the more he was conscious of a sort of fierce restlessness that drove the blood through his veins at feverish pace he wandered from room to room playing a game of billiards chafing all the time at the necessity of finishing the game he hurried away pleading an appointment in the hall he met greening who led him at once to a secluded corner prepared with your apologia tallente he inquired it's in your office at the present moment tallente replied finished this morning greening stroked his beard he was a lank rather cadaverous man with a face like granite and eyes like polished steel few men had anything to say against him no one liked him how are you regarding the appearance of these outpourings of yours tallente he asked with equanimity was the calm rejoinder i think i told you what i thought of you and your journalism for having any dealings with a thief and for making yourself a receiver of stolen property i have nothing to add to that i am ready to face the worst now and you may find the thunders recoil on your own head no one will ever be able to blame us Greening replied for publishing material of such deep interest to everyone even though it should incidentally be your political death warrant as a matter of fact tallente i was rather hoping that i might meet you here to-night the chief and horlock appear to have had a breeze how does that concern me tallente asked bluntly it may concern you very much indeed a few days ago i should have told you as i did that nothing in the world could stop the publication of that article to-day i am not so sure at any rate i believe there is a chance would you care to see the chief i haven't the slightest desire to tallente replied i have made my protest nothing in the world can affect the morality of your action at the same time i have got over my first dread of it i am prepared with my defence and perhaps a little in the way of a counter-attack no i am not going hat in hand to your chief greening he must do as he thinks well if that is your attitude greening observed things will probably take their course on the other hand if you were inclined to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with the chief and our other editors i believe that something might come of it in other words tallente said coldly your chief who was one of the most magnificent opportunists i ever knew has suddenly begun to wonder whether he is backing the right horse something like it perhaps Renning admitted look here tallente he went on you're a big man in your way and i know perfectly well that you wouldn't throw away a real advantage out of pique consider this matter i can't pledge the paper or the chief i simply say see him and talk it over tallente shook his head i am much obliged greening he said but i don't want to go through life with this thing hanging over me miller has a copy of the article without a doubt if you turn him down he'll find someone else to publish it i should never know when the thunderbolt was going to fall i am prepared now and i would rather get it over is dartrey going to back you greening asked tallente smiled i can't give away secrets greening turned slowly away i am off for a rubber of bridge he said i am sorry tallente better dismiss this interview from your mind altogether 
it very likely wouldn't have led to anything all the same i envy you your confidence if i could only guess at its source i'd have a leader for to-morrow morning tallente walked down the stairs with a smile upon his lips he put on his hat and coat and hesitated for a moment on the broad steps then a sudden wonderful thought came to him an impulse entirely irresistible he started off westward walking with feverish haste the spirit of adventure sat in his heart as he passed through the crowded streets the night was wonderfully clear the stars were brilliant overhead and from behind the coliseum dome a corner of the yellow moon was showing he was conscious of a sudden new feeling of kinship with these pleasure-seeking crowds who jostled him here and there upon the pavement he was glad to find himself amongst them and of them he felt that he had come down from the chilly heights to walk the lighted highways of the world the keen air with its touch of frost invigorated him there was a new suppleness in his pulses a queer excitement in his whole being which he scarcely understood until his long walk came to an end and he found himself at a standstill in front of the house in charles street his unadmitted destination he glanced at his watch and found that it was half an hour after midnight there was a light in the tower room into which jane had taken him on the night of her arrival in town above the whole of the house seemed in darkness he walked a little way down the street and back again jane was dining he knew with the princess de Fenapus, her godmother and had spoken of going on to a ball with her afterwards in that case she could scarcely be home for hours yet somehow he had a joyful conviction that history would repeat itself that he would find her as he had once before entering the house his fortune was in the ascendant not even the emptiness of the street discouraged him he strolled a little way along and back again as he passed the door once more something bright lying underneath the scraper attracted his notice he paused and stooped down almost before he had realized what he was doing he had picked up a small key her latch-key and was holding it in his hand he passed down the street again and there seemed something unreal in the broad pavement the frowning houses the glow of the gas lamps the harmless little key burned his flesh all the passionate acuteness of life seemed throbbing again in his veins he retraced his steps making no plans obeying only an ungovernable instinct the street was empty he thrust the key into the lock opened the door replaced the key under the scraper entered the house and made his way into the room on the right tallente stood there for a few minutes with fast-beating heart he had the feeling that he had burned his boats he was face to face now with realities there was no sound from anywhere a bright fire was burning in the grate an easy chair was drawn up to the side of a small table on which was placed a tumbler some biscuits a box of cigarettes and some matches a copper saucepan full of milk stood in the hearth side by side with some slippers dainty fur topped slippers even these slight evidences of her coming presence seemed to thrill him time dissolved away into a dream of anticipation minutes or hours might have passed before he heard the motor stop outside her voice bidding some friend a cheerful good night the turning of the key in the door the drawing of a bolt a light step in the hall and then jane she was wrapped from head to foot in white furs a small tiara of emeralds and diamonds on her head she entered humming a tune to herself serene desirable andrew her exclamation the light in her eyes the pleasure which swiftly took the place of her first amazement intoxicated him he drew her into his arms and his voice shook jane he confessed i tried to keep away and i couldn't i stole in here to wait for you and you're glad thank heavens you're glad but how long have you been here she asked wonderingly he shook his head i don't know i walked down the street hoping for a miracle then i saw your key under the scraper i let myself in and waited jane how wonderful you are unconsciously she had unfastened and thrown aside her furs her arms and neck shone like alabaster in the shaded light she looked into his face and began to tremble a little 
you ought not to have done this she said why not he pleaded if any one had seen you if the servants knew he laughed and stopped her mouth with a kiss dear these things are trifles the things that count lie between us two only do you know that you have been in my blood like a fever all day you were there in the house this afternoon you walked the streets with me you drew me here jane i haven't felt like this since i was a boy you have brought me back my youth i adore you again she rested willingly enough in his arms smiling at him as he drew near to her with wonderful kindness the fire of his lips however seemed to disturb her she felt the enveloping turmoil of his passion now become almost ungovernable and extricated herself gently from his arms put my saucepan on the fire please she begged you will find some whisky and soda on the sideboard there parkins evidently thinks that i ought to have a male escort when i come home late i don't want whisky and soda jane he cried passionately i want you she rested her hand upon his shoulder and i am not yours dear she asked foolishly unwisely perhaps but certainly yours they were all talking about you tonight at dinner and i was so proud she went on a little feverishly our was almost eloquent he said that democracy led by you instead of proving a curse might be the salvation of the country because you have political insight and imperialistic ideas it is those terrible people who would make a parish council of parliament from whom one has most to fear tallente made no reply he was standing on a hearth rug a few feet away from her watching as she stirred her milk watching the curve of her body the grace of her long smoothly shining arms and beyond these things he strove to read what was at the back of her mind we must talk almost in whispers she went on and do have your whiskey and soda andrew because you must go very soon it would disturb you very much if your servants were to know of my presence here he asked in a queer even tone of course it would she answered without looking at him as you know i have lived from my standpoints an extraordinarily unconventional life but that was because i knew myself and was safe but i have never done anything like this before in my life you have never been in the same position he reminded her there has never been any one else to consider except yourself true enough she admitted but oughtn't that to make one all the more careful i loved seeing you when i came in i have loved our few minutes together but i am getting a little nervous do you see that it is past two o'clock there is no one to whom you are accountable for anything in life except me he told her passionately she laughed softly but a little uneasily dear andrew she said there is my own sense of what is seemly and must i use the horrid word my reputation to be considered as it is you may be seen leaving the house in the small hours of the morning a little shiver passed through him all the splendid warmth of living seemed to be fading away from his heart and thoughts he was back again in that empty world of unreal persons jane had been a dream this kindly-faced beautiful but anxious girl was not the jane to whose arms he had come hot-foot through the streets i ought not to have come he muttered dear i don't blame you in the least she answered only be very careful as you go out if there is any one passing in the street wait for a moment i understand he promised i will take the greatest care he took up his hat and coat mechanically she thrust her arm through his and led him to the door looking furtively into his face as though afraid of what she might find there her own heart was beginning to beat faster she was filled with a queer sense of failure you are not angry with me andrew you know that i have been happy to see you i am not angry he answered there was a little choking in her throat she felt the rush of strange things her eyes sought his filled with almost terrified anticipation it chanced that he was looking away she clenched her hands his moment had passed there is something else on your mind andrew i know but to-night we cannot talk any longer she said 
and something resembling her old tone be very careful dear to-morrow you will come to-morrow he walked down the hall with the footsteps of a cat let himself out silently into the empty street and walked with leaden footsteps to his rooms it was not until he had reached the seclusion of his study that the change came a sudden dull fury burned in his heart he poured himself out whiskey and drank it neat then he seated himself before his desk and wrote he did not once hesitate he did not reread a single sentence he dug up the anger and the bitterness from his heart and set them out in flaming phrases a sort of lunacy drove him into the bitterest of extremes his brain seemed fed with the inspiration of his suffering fed with cruel epigrams and biting words he dragged his idol down into the dust scoffed at the piecemeal passion which measures its gifts the complacency of an analyzed virtue the sense of well-living and self-contentment achieved in the rubric of a dry-as-dust morality she had failed him offered him stones instead of bread he signed the letter blotted it with firm fingers addressed the envelope stamped it and dropped it himself into the pillar-box at the corner of the street then he turned wearily homeward filled with a strange almost maniacal satisfaction of the man who has killed the thing he loves End of chapter thirty two chapter thirty three of nobody's man by e phillips oppenheim this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Roy. chapter thirty three there followed days of sullen battle for talent a battle with luck against him with his back to the wall with despair more than once yawning at his feet the house in charles street was closed there had come no word to him from jane no news even of her departure except the somewhat surprised reply of parkins when he had called on the following afternoon her ladyship left for devonshire sir by the ten fifty train tallant went back to the fight with those words ringing in his ears he had deliberately torn to pieces his house of refuge success or failure what did it matter now yet with the dogged courage of one loathing failure for failure's own sake he flung himself into the struggle on the fifth day after jane's departure the thunderbolt fell tallente's article was printed in full and the weaker members of the democratic party shouted at once for his resignation at a question cunningly framed by dartrey tallente rose in the house to defend his position and acting on the soundest axiom of military tactics that the best defence is attack he turned upon miller and with caustic deliberation exposed the plot framed for his undoing he threw caution to the winds and though repeatedly and gravely called to order he poured out his scorn upon his enemy till the latter white as a sheep rose to demand the protection of the speaker there were very few in the house that day who ever forgot the almost terrifying spectacle of miller's collapse under his adversary's hurricane assault or the proud and dignified manner in which tallente concluded his own defence but this was only the first step the labour press throughout the country took serious alarm at an attack which though out of date and influenced by conditions no longer predominant yet struck a very lusty blow at the very existence of their great nervous centres miller as chairman of the associated trades unions issued a manifesto which notwithstanding his declining influence exercised considerable effect it seemed clear that he could rely still upon a good ninety votes in the house of commons horlock became more cheerful he met tallente leaving the house one windy march evening and the two men shared a taxi together westwards looks to me like another year of office thanks to you the prime minister observed linton tells me that we shall have a majority of forty on thursday week it is thursday week you're going for us again isn't it many things may happen before then tallente replied with a little affirmative nod dartrey may decide that i am too expensive a luxury and make friends with miller i don't think that's likely horlock pronounced dartrey is fine fellow although he is not a great politician 
he is out to make a radical and solid change in the government of this country and he knows very well that miller's gang will only be a dead weight around his neck he'd rather wait until he has weaned away a few more votes even get rid of miller if he can and stick to you i think you are right tallente said i am keeping the democrats from a present triumph but if through me they shake themselves free from what i call the little laborites i think things will pan out better for them in the long run and in the meantime horlock went on lighting a cigar and passing his case to tallente i must give you the credit of playing a magnificent lone hand i expected to see miller fall down in a fit when you went for him in the house if only his army of adherents could have heard that little duel i think you'd have won straight through unfortunately they couldn't tallente sighed and it's so hard to capture the attention to reach the inner understanding of a great mixed community it's a curious thing about englishmen horlock reflected especially the englishman who has to vote the most eloquent appeals on paper often leave him unmoved a perfectly convincing pamphlet he lays down with the feeling that no doubt it's all right but there must be another side it's the spoken words that tell every time what about miller's election next week a great deal depends upon that tallente replied miller himself says that it is a certainty on the other hand saunderson is going to be proposed and with dartrey's influence should have a pretty good backing they travelled on in silence for a short time tallente looked idly through the rain-streaming window at the block of traffic the hurrying passers-by the cheerful warmth of the shops and restaurants you take life too seriously tallente his companion said a little abruptly do i tallente answered with a thin smile you do indeed look at me i haven't a line on my face as compared with yours and i've held together a patchwork government for five years i don't know when i may be kicked out and i know perfectly well that the government which succeeds mine is going to undo all i have done and is going to establish a state of things in this country which i consider nothing short of revolutionary i am not worrying about it tallente the fog of downing street stinks sometimes in my nostrils but i have a little country house you must come and see me there some day down in buckinghamshire one of these long low bungalow types you know with big gardens two tennis courts and a golf course just across the river my wife spends most of her time there now and every weekend when i go down i think what a fool i am to waste my time trying to hold a reluctant nation to principles they are thoroughly sick of tell me, you can turn me out whenever you like the day i settle down for two or three months rest is going to be one of the happiest of my life you have a wonderful temperament tallente remarked a little sadly temperament be damned was the forcible reply i have done my best when you said those four words tallente any man ought to have philosophy enough to add whatever the result may be it isn't going to be my funeral look at you haggard losing weight every day poring over papers scheming planning writing articles pouring out the great gift of your life twice as fast as you need no one will thank you for it it's quite enough to give half your soul and the joy of living to work for others keep something up your sleeve for yourself tallente mark you that's the soundest thing in twentieth century philosophy you'll ever hear of corner of church street right for you eh tallente held out his hand horlock he said thank you i know you're right but unfortunately i am not like you i haven't an idyllic retreat a charming companion waiting for me there a life outside that's so wonderful i am driven on because there's nothing else horlock laid his hand upon his companion's shoulder his tone was suddenly grave amply sympathetic my friend and enemy he said if that is so i'm sorry for you End of chapter thirty two chapter thirty four of nobody's man by e philip sopinon this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard.
Chapter Thirty Four. There was a tense air of expectation amongst the little company of men who filed into one of the smaller lecture rooms attached to Demos House a few afternoons later. Two long tables were arranged with sixty or seventy chairs, and a great ballot box was placed in front of the chairman. A little round of subdued cheers greeted the latter as he entered the room and took his place, the Right Honorable John Weevil, a privy councillor, member for Sheffield, and chairman of the Ironmasters' Union. Dartrey and Talent appeared together at the tail end of the procession. Miller sprang at once to his feet and addressed the chairman. Mr. Chairman, he said, I call attention to the fact that two honorary members of this company are present. I submit that as these honorary members have no vote and the present meeting is called with the sole object of voting a chairman for the year honorary members be not admitted mr weevil shook his head honorary members have the right to attend all meetings of our society he pronounced they can even speak if invited to do so by the chairman for the day i am sure that we are all of us very pleased indeed to welcome mr dartrey and mr tallente there was a murmur of approval in one or two cases a little dubious dartrey smiled a greeting at weevil i have asked mr tallente to accompany me he explained because in face of the great issues by which the party to which we all belong is confronted some question might arise on today's proceedings which would render his presence advisable he does not wish to address you i however with the chairman's permission before you go to the vote would like to say a few words miller again arose to his feet i submit mr chairman he said arrogantly that when i had the privilege of being elected last april no honorary member was present or allowed to speak mr weevil rose to his feet gentlemen he said you know what this meeting is it is a meeting of fifty-seven representatives of the various trades unions of the country to elect a single representative to take the chair whenever meetings of this company shall be necessary this gathering does not exist as a society in any shape or form and we have therefore neither rules nor usages mr dartrey and mr tallente although they are honorary members are i am sure welcome guests and whatever either of them wishes to say to us will i am sure be listened to there is no business all that we have to do is to vote to choose our leader for the next twelve months there are two names put forward saunderson and miller it is my business only to count the votes you may record presuming that no one else wishes to speak i shall ask mr dartrey to say those few words miller sat frowning and biting his nails dartrey moved to the farther end of the room and looked down the long line of attentive faces weevil he said and you my friends I am not here to say a word in favor of either of the two candidates between whom you have to choose today. I am here just because you are valued members of the great party which before very long will be carrying upon its shoulders the burden of this country's government, to tell you of one measure which some of you know of already, which may help you to realize how important your today's choice will be. You know quite as much about politics as I do you know very well that the present government is doomed but for an unfortunate difference of opinion between two of our supporters who are present today there is not the slightest doubt that the government would lose their vote of confidence tomorrow and that in that case if i still remained your chief i should be asked to form a democratic government a task which when the time comes it is my intention to pass on to one more skilled in parliamentary routine i want to explain to you that we consider the representative you elect today to be one of the most important personages in that government we have not issued our program yet when we do we are going to make the country a wonderful promise we are going to promise that there shall be no more strikes that sounds a large order perhaps but we shall keep our word and we are going to end forever this bitter struggle between capital and labor by welding the two into one and by making the interests of one of the interests of the other our scheme is that the person whom you elect today will be chairman of an inner conference of twelve we shall ask you to elect a further three from amongst yourselves 
which will give the trades unions four representatives upon this inner council four representative cabinet ministers will be chosen by ballot to add to their number four employers of labor elected by the employers association will also join the council and the whole will be presided over by the person whom you elect to-day there will be a select committee or rather fifty-seven select committees of each industry always at hand and we consider that we shall frame in that manner a body of men competent to deal with the inner workings of every industry they will decide what proportion of the earnings of each industry shall be allocated to labor and what to capital in other words they will fix or approve of or revise the wages of the country they will settle every dispute and their decision will be final the funds held by the various trades unions will form charitable funds or be returned as bonuses to the contributors i have given you the barest outline of the scheme which has been drawn up to form a part of our program when the time comes for us to present one to-day you are only concerned to elect the one representative i am here to beg gentlemen that you elect one whose theories whose principles whose antecedents and whose general attitude towards labor problems will fit him to take a very important place in the future government of the country there was a little murmur of applause miller was once more on his feet i claim he said that this is neither the time nor the place to spring upon us an utterly new method of dealing with labor questions what you propose seems to me a subtle attack upon the trades unions themselves they have been the guardians of the people for the last fifteen years and even though some strikes have been necessary and although all strikes may not have been successful yet on the whole the trades unions have done their work well i shall not accept in the event of my election the program which mr dartrey has laid down unless i am elected with a special mandate to do so saunderson rose to his feet a man of different type blunt of speech rugged the typical working man's champion except for his voice which was of unexpected tone and quality mr weevil and the rest of you he said i differ from miller that's lucky because you can vote now not only for the man but the principal i have loathed strikes all my life just because i am a political economist enough to loathe waste and to hate to see production fettered that is where the fruits of the production are shared fairly with labor i like dartrey's scheme and i am prepared to stand by it saunderson sat down dartrey and tallente left the room while the business of voting went on dartrey had a private room of his own in the rear of the building and he and tallente made their way there those men have a good deal to decide tallente reflected it's queer how the balance of things has changed i don't suppose any cabinet council for years has had to tackle a more important problem i wonder how they'll vote dartrey speculated weevil's our man you can't tell tallente replied you've given them something fresh to think about they may even decide not to vote to-day at all miller has some strong supporters he appeals tremendously to a certain class of labor and that class exists you know dartrey which loves the excitement and the loafing of a strike which feels somehow or other that benefits got in any other way than by force are less than they ought to have been there was a knock at the door northern put in his head he was the boot and shoe representative thought i'd let you know how the thing's gone he said there's an unholy row there they've chucked miller saunderson's in by five votes i'm off back again miller's up speaking tearing mad he nodded and disappeared dartrey held out his hand thank god he exclaimed let's clear-cut talent nora must know about this at once will call at the house and enter your amendment against the vote of confidence and then nora i am not sure talent the man's a subtle fellow but i rather think we've driven the final nail into miller's coffin End of chapter thirty four chapter thirty five of nobody's man by e philip Oppenheim. 
this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Gerard. chapter thirty five the great night came and passed with fewer thrills than anyone had imagined possible horlick himself undertook the defence of his once more bitterly assailed government and from the first it was obvious what the end must be he spoke with the resigned cynicism of one who knows that words are fruitless that the die is already cast and that his little froth of words valedictory in their tone from the first was only a tribute to exacting convention talent had never been more restrained although his merciless logic reduced the issues upon which the vote was to be taken to the plainest and clearest elements he remained studiously unemotional and nothing which he said indicated in any way his personal interest in the sweeping away of the horlock regime he was the impersonal but scathing critic paving the way for his chief it was dartrey himself who overshadowed every one that night he spoke so seldom in the house that many of the members had forgotten that he was an orator of rare quality that night he lifted the debate from the level of ordinary politics to the idyllic realms where alone the lasting good of the world is fashioned he pointed out what government might and should be taking almost a roman view of the care of the citizen his early and late education his shouldering of the responsibilities which belong to one of a great community from the individual he passed to the nation sketching in a few nervous but brilliant phrases the exact possibilities of socialistic legislation and he wound up with a parodied epigram government he declared was philosophy teaching by failures in the end miller led fourteen of his once numerous followers into the government lobby to find himself by forty votes upon the losing side horlock found talent once more slipping quietly away from the house and bundled him into his car they drove off rapidly so it's buckinghamshire for me the former observed not without jubilation after all it has been rather a tame finale we were beaten before we opened our mouths even your new adherent talent said smiling could not save you horlock made a grimace you can have miller and his faithful fourteen he declared we don't want him the man was a little englander he has become a little labourite heaven knows where he'll end are you going to be prime minister talent i don't know was the quiet reply just for the moment i am weary of it all day after day fighting and scheming speaking and writing just to get you fellows out and now we've got you out well i don't know that we are going to do any better we've got the principles we've got some of the men but is this country ready for our program if you ask me i think the country's ready for anything in the way of a change horlock replied i am sure i am i have been prime minister before but i've never in my life had such an army of incompetence at the back of me take my tip talent don't you have a chancellor of the exchequer who refuses to take a bit off the income tax every year we shall abolish the income tax before long talent declared i shall invest my money in america horlock observed my savings that is where shall i put you down in chelsea if you would talent begged we are only just turning off the embankment i want to see mrs dartrey horlock gave an order through the tube i am going down to belgrave square he said then i am going back to downing street for to-night to-morrow a dutiful journey to buckingham palace saturday a long weekend i shall take out a season ticket to buckinghamshire now you're not going to nationalize the railways or are you talent what about season tickets then nationalization is badly defined talent replied the government will certainly aim at regulating the profits of all public companies and applying a portion of them to the reduction of taxation well good luck to you horlock said heartily as the car pulled up outside dartrey's little house here's just a word of advice from an old campaigner you're going to tap the people's pockets that's what you are going to do talent and i tell you this and you'll find it's the truth principles or no principles your own party or any one else's 
the moment you touch the pockets of any class of the community from the aristocrat to the stonebreaker they'll be up against you like a hurricane everyone in the world hugs their principles but there isn't anyone who'd hold on to them if they found it was costing them money so long and the best of luck to you talent we may meet in high circles before long horlock drove away a discomfited man jubilant in his thoughts of freedom talent was met by nora in the little hall nora who had kept away from the house at stephen's earnest request stephen has done it talent announced triumphantly he made the only speech worth listening to horlock crumpled to pieces miller only got fourteen of the ragtail end of his lot to vote with him we won by forty votes horlock brought me here he is to have a formal meeting of the party he'll offer his resignation on thursday it's wonderful nora exclaimed stephen will be sent for talent went on that of course is a foregone conclusion nora i wish you'd make him see that it's his duty to form a government there isn't any reason why he should pass it on to me i can lead in the commons if he wants me to so far as the debates are concerned we are altering the procedure as i dare say you know half the government of the country will be done by committees it's no use nora replied stephen simply wouldn't do it you must remember what you yourself said procedure will be altered so much of the government of the country will be done outside the house stephen has everything mapped out you are going to be prime minister talent left early and walked homeward by the least frequented ways a soft rain was falling but the night was warm and a misty moon made fitful appearances the rain fell like little drops of silver around the lamp-posts there was scurcely a breath of wind and in curzon street the air was almost faint with the odor of spring bulbs from the window boxes talent yielded to an uncontrollable impulse he walked rather abruptly up charges street past his rooms and paid a curious little visit almost a pilgrimage to the closed house in charles street it seemed to him that those drawn blinds the dead-looking windows the smokeless chimneys typified in melancholy fashion the empty chambers in his own heart weeks had passed now and no word had come from jane he pictured her still smarting under the sting of his brutal words some of his phrases came back to his mind and he shivered with remorse if only he started it seemed for a moment as though history were about to repeat itself a great limousine had stolen up to the curbstone and a woman in evening dress was leaning out mr talent she called out do come and speak to me please talent approached at once in the dim light his heart gave a little throb he peered forward the woman laughed musically i do believe that you have forgotten me she said i am alice montgomery jane's sister i saw you there and i couldn't help stopping for a moment can i drop you anywhere thank you so much he answered my rooms are quite close by here on charges street get in please and i will take you there she ordered tell the man the number i want just one word with you the car started off lady alice looked at her companion and shook her head mr talent she said i am very much a woman of the world and jane is a very much stronger person than i am in some things and a great baby in others you and she were such friends and i have an idea that there was a misunderstanding there was he groaned it was my fault never mind whose fault it was she went on you two were made for each other you have so much in common don't drift apart altogether just because one has expected too much or the other been content to give too little jane has a great soul and a great heart she wants to give but she doesn't quite know how and perhaps there isn't any way but two people whose lives seem to radiate towards each other as yours and hers shouldn't remain wholly apart take a day or two's holiday soon even from this great work of yours and go down to devonshire it would be very dangerous advice she went on smiling to a different sort of man but i have a fancy that to you it may mean something and i happen to know that jane is miserable the car stopped talent held lady alice's hand as he had seldom held the hand of a woman in his life 
a curious incapacity for speech checked the words even upon his lips thank you he faltered End of chapter thirty five chapter thirty six of nobody's man by e phillips oppenheim this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. chapter thirty six upon the moor above martinhoe and the farmlands adjoining spring had fallen that year as gently as the warm rain of april Talon, conscious of an unexpected lassitude paused as he reached the top of the zigzag climb from the manor and rested for a moment upon a block of stone below him the forests of dwarf oaks which stretched down to the sea were tipped with delicate green the meadows were like deep soft patches of emerald verdure the fruit trees in his small walled garden were pink and white with blossoms the sea was peaceful as an azure lake into which the hulls of the passing steamers cut like knives leaving behind a long line of lazy foam little fleecy balls of cloud were dotted across the sky puffs of soft wind cooled his cheeks when he rose to his feet and faced inland soon he left the stony road and walked upon the springing turf bordering the moorland little curled-up shoots of light green were springing from the bracken here and there a flame of gorse filled the air with its faint almond-like blossom and the birds farmlands stretched away on his left-hand side and above the tender growth of corn larks invisible but multifarious filled the air with little quiverings of melody bleating lambs ridiculously young tottered around on this new-found wonderful earth a pair of partridges scurried away from his feet the end of a drooping cloud splashed his face with a few warm raindrops Talent, as he swung onwards carrying his cap in his hand felt a great glow of thankfulness for the impulse which had brought him here already he was finding himself the tangled emotions of the last week were loosening their grip upon his brain and consciousness behind him london was in an uproar his name and future the theme of every journal journalists were besieging his rooms embryo statesmen were telephoning for appointments great men sent their secretaries to suggest a meeting and in the midst of it all he had disappeared the truth as to his sudden absence from town was unknown even to dartrey at the very moment when his figure loomed large and triumphant upon one of the great canvases in history he had simply slipped away a disappearance as dramatic as it was opportune and all because he had a fancy to see how spring sat upon the moors and because he had walked back to his rooms by way of charles street and because he had met lady alice the last descent was finished and below him lay the house and climbing woods woods that crept into the bosom of the hills the closely growing trees tipped with tender greens melting into the softest of indeterminate rays as the breeze rippled through their tops like fingers across a harp the darker line of moorland in the background scant as ever of herbage had yet lost its menacing bareness and seemed touched with the faint colour of the earth beneath almost pink in the generous sunshine the avenue into which he presently turned was starred on either side with a riot of primroses running wild into the brambles with here and there a belt of bluebells the atmosphere beneath the closely growing trees limes with great waxy buds became enervating with spring odors and momentary breathlessness came to talent fresh from his crowded days and nights of battle the sun warmed wave of perfume from the trim beds of hyacinths in the suddenly disclosed garden was almost overpowering and he passed like a man in a dream through their sweetness to the front door the butler who admitted him conducted him at once to jane's sanctum without any warning he was ushered in mr tallant your ladyship he had a strange impression of her as she rose from a very sea of newspapers she was thinner he was sure of that dressed in indoor clothes although it was the middle of the morning 
a suggestion of the invalid about her easy chair and her tired eyes it seemed to him that for a moment they were lit with a gleam of fear which passed almost instantaneously she had recovered herself even before the door was closed behind the departing servant mr tallente she repeated you but how is this possible everything is possible he answered i have come to see you jane she was glad but amazed even when he had obeyed her involuntary gesture and seated himself by her side there was something incredulous about her expression but what does it mean that you are here just now she persisted according to the newspapers you should be at buckingham palace to-day to-morrow he corrected her i hired a very powerful car and motored down yesterday afternoon i am starting back when the moon rises to-night for these few hours i am better out of london but why she faltered he was slowly finding himself i came for you jane he said on any terms anyhow i came to beg for your sympathy for some measure of your affection to beg you to come back to charles street is it too late for me to abase myself her eyes glowed across at him she suddenly rose came over and knelt by the side of his chair her arms went around his neck andrew she whispered i have been ashamed i was wrong that night the thought of my pettiness my foolish selfish fears oh i was wrong i have prayed that the time might come when i could tell you and if you hadn't come i never could have told you i couldn't have written i couldn't have come to london but i wanted you to know she drew his head down and kissed him upon the lips talent knew then why he had come the whole orchestra of life was playing again he was strong enough to overcome mountains andrew she faltered you really he stopped her jane he said i have some stupid news it seems to me incredibly stupid let me pass it on to you quickly you knew didn't you that i was married in america well my wife has divorced me there we married in a state where such things are possible divorced you she exclaimed quite legally he went on i saw a lawyer before i started yesterday morning but listen to the rest of it stella is married married to the man i thought i had thrown over the cliff she is married to anthony palliser then you are free jane murmured drawing a little away not in the least he replied i am engaged to marry you at luncheon with parkins in attendance it became possible for them to converse coherently when i found you at home in the middle of the morning he said i was afraid that you were ill i haven't been well she admitted i rode some distance yesterday and it fatigued me somehow or other i think i have had the feeling the last few weeks that my work here is over all my farms are sold i have really now no means of occupying my time it is fortunate he told her with a smile that i am able to point out to you a new sphere of usefulness she made a little grimace at him behind parkins august back tell me she asked how did you ever make your peace with the trades unions after that terrible article of yours because he replied except for miller their late chief there are a great many highly intelligent men connected with the administration of the trades unions they realized the spirit in which i wrote that article and the condition of the country at the time i wrote it my apologia was accepted by everyone who counted the publication of that article he went on was miller's scheme to drive me out of politics it has turned out to be the greatest godsend ever vouchsafed to our cause for it is going to put mr miller out of the power of doing mischief for a uh, many years to come how i hated him when he called here that day jane murmured reminiscently miller is the type of man talent declared who was always putting the labor party in a false position he was born and he has lived and he has thought parochially he is all the time lashing himself into a fury over imagined wrongs and wanting to play the little tin god on olympus with his threatened strikes now there will be no more strikes 
i was reading about that she reflected how wonderful it sounds the greatest power in the country tallente explained is that wielded by these trades unions there will be no more fights between the government and them because they are calling into the government i am afraid you will think our program revolutionary on the other hand it is going to be a government of justice we want to give the people their due each man according to his worth by that means we wipe out all fear forever of the scourge of eastern and mid-europe the bolshevism and anarchy which have laid great empires bare we are not going to make the poor add to the riches of the rich but on the other hand we are not going to take from the rich to give to the poor the sociological scheme upon which our plan of government will be based is to open every avenue to success equally to rich and poor the human being must sink or swim according to his capacity ours will never be a state-aided socialism parkins had left the room she held out her hand how horrid of you she murmured you are jibing at me because i lent my farmers a little money he laughed softly you dear he exclaimed on my honour it never entered my head only i want to bring you gradually into the new way of thinking because i want so much from you so much help and sympathy and she pleaded he looked around to be sure that parkins was gone and leaning from his place kissed her if you care for a moonlight motoring he whispered i think i can give you quite a clear outline of all that i expect from you she drew a little sigh of relief if you had left me behind she murmured i should have sat here and imagined that it was all a dream and i am just a little weary of dreams end of chapter thirty six end of nobody's man by e phillips oppenheim